joining us tonight um, for our study of the book of Revelation. Uh, it's good to have you here with us. As is usually the case, just want to make sure that you remember, or for those that may be joining us for the first time, if you're watching live, my wife Melissa is here with me and she's uh, reading the comments. And so if there's any questions or comments, or if you want to interact or interject at any point, just leave a comment there and Melissa will get my attention. Um, just to be real honest, I'm not capable of uh, studying or, or leading the study and reading the comments at the same time. So thankfully she takes that off my hands for me. So again, as we go through, we'll be in Revelation chapter 8. We're going to read verses 1 through 6 tonight. But I do believe that Bible study, the best way to study the Bible is, is together. And the best way to study the Bible is through interaction. We are limited with what we can do using Facebook Live and other online platforms, but we're going to do the best that we can. So if you have questions, if you want to interject, just leave a comment and she will get my attention as we go through. If you would, just bow your head with me today and we will start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight that we can gather in your presence, we can gather in your name, and we can gather around your word even when we can't be physically together. And so we just thank you for not just making it possible, thank you for putting it in our hearts, the longing to be together in your presence and with your word. And so I ask tonight that you would open our hearts and you would open our minds and that you would allow us to look deeply at your word and see more of your character, see more of your heart, and just see more of the fabric of who you are as God our Father and Jesus as our Lord. Thank you for the anointing that you gave John to be able to see these revelations and then write them down so that we could know them. I pray tonight that the same way the Holy Spirit anointed John, that he would anoint us, that we would be anointed to read and to understand, but above all else, that we would be anointed to obey your word by the way we live our lives, by the condition of our hearts, by the way we try to live for Jesus, by living like Jesus. And so tonight, just lead us in paths of righteousness for your namesake. Dig into the deep places of our hearts. Turn over anything that's grown fallow and produce fruit through our lives. Pray that your word would do its work in your people tonight. We love you. We trust you. And truthfully, God, we cherish these opportunities to be together in your word, led by your spirit, and being molded and shaped into the image of your most beloved son. Have your way tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, Revelation chapter 8, we'll start with verse 1 and we'll read through verse 6. It says, when he, and there it's speaking of Jesus as the Lamb, when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the angels who stand before God, excuse me, and I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with, with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightning, and an earthquake. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Tonight, as we start Revelation 8, which ends the opening of the seven seals and then begins the sounding of the seven trumpets, I want us to be reminded of two things. First and foremost, John's first words of the letter. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Mm. This letter is not about the end of the world. It is the revelation of who Jesus is as the Christ. According to Strong's Concordance, the first meaning of the Greek word that we translate as revelation is laying bare, making naked. That means that this letter shows Jesus as he truly is. It strips away any of our misapplications and misinterpretations. It even strips away any of the mystery of Jesus as the Christ. 
It's not a letter that is meant to tell us the day or the time of Jesus' return. It's not meant to be how we decipher the end times. It's meant to be how we see Jesus clearly and rightly. Because if we see Jesus as he is, our understanding of his character will apply to our understanding of the days and the times that we live in and those that have come before us and even those that come after us. The key in all of our lives is not knowing what's going on, but knowing who's in control and then knowing the depth of his character. This letter is meant to prepare the hearts of the kingdom for the coming and the character of her king. As we venture into greater descriptions and greater perspectives upon judgment, let's not take our eyes off the king. Let's not get sucked in to the emotional parts of reading things that are uncomfortable, but instead let's keep our emotions in check by telling ourselves the truth about the one who is actually sovereign over everything that we're reading. Secondly, I want us to take... I want, us to, 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 I want to take us back to the quote that we've been sharing since we were in chapter 5. Daniel Green wrote, The original readers would have been comforted by understanding that while their world was most uncertain, heaven was properly focused and stable. As we've talked about many times over the last few months, stability is the fruit of proper focus. Heaven is stable because its focus never shifts from the Lamb, from the one who sits on the throne, and from the seven spirits around God's throne. If we read honestly, we see that heaven is affected. The martyrs cry out for judgment. The angels are active in God's plans. The elders and creatures never cease their worship. Their stability does not come from being unaffected by the events. Their stability comes from staying rightly focused. Part of me believes that's actually one of the biggest reasons the letter was written, one of the biggest reasons that the vision was given. God in his kindness, knowing that the world in their day was unstable, and knowing that the world in our day would be just as unstable, gave us a clear picture of Jesus to hold on to in the midst of the shaking. It's interesting to me that we started using this quote long before we got to the pandemic, long before we got to this place of unrest, of political turmoil, of, of, of riots and protests, of, of people going back and forth against each other, of people trying to undermine each other's character so that they can get the position that they want. Before we got to any of this where the world seems to be turned upside down, the, we were already in a place as a small group of people where we were working hard to keep our stability by maintaining our focus. Heaven is stable because it's focused. So please remember the book of Revelation was originally written to seven churches in Asia that were suffering persecution. But Revelation is also given to every church of every nation of every era until Jesus returns. So we must reject the temptation to make the book of Revelation about right here or right now and instead be faithful to make it about Jesus always and Jesus everywhere. Rather than us asking questions about Revelation, what about if we took it and we turned everything and we started trying to answer the questions that Revelation is asking about us? Because that's what the scripture does. It reveals God's character, but it also reveals our condition. It shows us who God is, but then it cuts and it divides who we are versus who we were meant to be. So as we're studying Revelation, we should be asking questions like these. Where is our confidence? Where is our allegiance? Are we hoping for or are we hoping in? Do we know and believe that Jesus has authority over all things at all times? Do we want his kingdom more than we want our comfort? Do we trust his love more than we fear our trouble? Are we ready to believe that he is sovereign, that these things we are seeing in the world and in the scripture are not happening to us, they are happening for us because they are purposed by God? What should we be doing to join the work of redemption rather than fearing the pain of judgment? See, because that's what Revelation is all about. 
It's the unfolding of the plan of redemption. It is the character of God. It is the revelation of Jesus. And it is the outpouring of a promise that cannot be thwarted. The world will be judged. But in the middle of judgment, there will be incredible redemption. So the question we have to ask ourselves is not when does this happen or what does this mean? It is what should we be doing? How do we join the work of redemption as Jesus is glorified in the largest portion that he'll ever be glorified? So as we transition from chapter 7 to chapter 8, from a vision of the multitudes being saved out of the great tribulation to pictures of the judgment that led to their salvation, it's important that we make sure we are looking at Jesus in every verse we read. It's important that we train our hearts not to look at the wind and the waves, but to keep our eyes fixed firmly on Jesus. If Peter's life taught us anything, it is that great faith can put us in position, in miraculous positions, but that if we don't keep our attention on Jesus, even in our faith, even in miraculous places, we can start to sink. And so as we study our way through Revelation, what we want to make sure we do is not look away, from the one that's being laid bare for us. Don't get caught up in the judgment. Keep your focus on the Savior. Keep your focus on the Sovereign. Let's see the one that is doing the shaking rather than allowing ourselves to be shaken with everything else. If we are called to pray for God's kingdom to come and his will to be done here on earth as it is in heaven, and if heaven is properly focused and stable, then what must those doing the praying be? We must be just like heaven if we're going to pray for heaven to come. We must be focused on Jesus, and we must be stable as we are held in the hands of the Father. And so as we, pray, as, we, as we study tonight, as we start reading tonight, concentrate on two things. Seeing Jesus and staying focused. Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. It says, when he, and again it's speaking of Jesus, opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven, for about half an hour. So this verse throws us right back into the sovereignty of Jesus. This verse is the lamb looking as if he were slain, opening the seventh, opening the final seal. And when he did, something that we haven't seen in Revelation happened. It tells us that heaven went silent for half an hour. So far in the first seven chapters, heaven has been anything but silent in the visions. The elders, creatures, and angels have sung songs and made statements. There has been thunder and lightning from the throne of God. The multitudes have declared the saving power of the Lamb and the one who sits on the throne. And all of heaven has responded with songs of worship and songs of praise. We've even heard the martyrs pleading with God for vengeance. John has been heard weeping. But now, as the last seal is opened, meaning as the scroll is finally fully opened as the story of redemption finally becomes completely clear all of heaven goes silent now just let's think about this for a minute there were seven seals on the scroll that tells the story of redemption as each seal popped something happened as as jesus opened each one he gave authority to something to happen and so what we know, what heaven knows, is written in that scroll on each side is the story of redemption. And so when finally the seventh seal is removed and the scroll can be spread open for all to see, wouldn't you expect like a cheer? Wouldn't you expect that to be a, a time when a shofar blasts and songs begin and dancing ensues? But instead, heaven understands something about redemption that we miss. And that is that redemption is hard. Like redemption is glorious for the ones being redeemed, but for the redeemer, it is difficult. There, we talk often about salvation being free. The reality is it may be free for those being saved, but it is costly for the one doing the saving. And so heaven is looking at the lamb who looks as if he's been slain. And as he opens the scroll of redemption, they understand the price of redemption. And I think that's something that we have to visit here. I think that's something in this passage of Scripture we have to slow down with and realize that heaven goes completely silent. In Scripture, silence represents or indicates respect, 
reverence, submission, and anticipation. Just a few verses. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 20 says, But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Zechariah 2.13 says, Be silent all flesh before the Lord, for he has roused himself from his holy dwelling. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 2 says, Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth, so let your words be few. We know that James tells us to be slow to speak and quick to listen and slow to become angry. And I think sometimes we assume that that's something just given to us as humans. But nothing comes to earth unless it comes from heaven. And so when we're told, be slow to speak, what God is teaching, what the scriptures are teaching is, this is a heavenly principle. This is an eternal principle. This is the way heaven is governed. This is the way those who sit with the king react to the king. And so silence in our culture, in our comfort, is awkward. Silence in heaven is reverential. It's worshipful. The verses that may reveal this more than any other are Mark 15, 33 and Matthew 27, 45, when Jesus was being crucified. It says, and when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, which is from noon until 3 p.m. See, for me, I equate that darkness with silence. I believe that the heavens went dark, which means that they went silent when Jesus was being crucified. I've taught about this before, usually sometime around, uh, around Passover, around Resurrection, and around um, Good Friday. But the reality is that we miss so often when we tell the story, is that as Jesus was hanging on the cross, everything went dark dark, which again signals silence. The sun stopped shining. The, and, and, and most of us know this, that even when the sun goes dark, you can sometimes see clouds. You can sometimes see stars. You can see through our atmosphere to see what's in space. The fact that it went dark means the heavens silenced themselves out of reverence, out of worship, out of anticipation for what was happening, but also what was be going to happen. And so as we get back here to Revelation 8, 1, if heaven is silent, something powerful is happening, which means as we read, we need to be listening and we need to be watching. I believe we must work hard not to rush through to the next verse when we are reading and praying our way through Revelation. But let each verse prepare our hearts for what we are about to read, about what is about to be shown to us. Very honestly, have you ever just sat with Revelation 8.1 and just thought about silence in heaven? We're told that the elders and the creatures, that they worship forever, that they never stop bowing down and singing. And yet here we are told they stop. How important is what we're about to see. If heaven actually changes its usual function to make sure that what's about to happen receives the reverence that, that it deserves. Just sit with it for a minute. And we're not going to have some awkward pause, but sit with it for a minute and think about it. And when you have time, go back to it and just concentrate on heaven being silent in that moment. Because I believe it's something that we need to learn how to be silenced by in many of our moments. If it was worthy of silence in heaven, it's worthy of the preparation of our hearts. How important is what is going to be shown if heaven goes silent in anticipation? Here's the thing, that silence is for us. It's to show us because John was being shown it and we were going to be shown it through revelation. So I believe the silence is to show us the weight of the moment. It's to get us to turn from ourselves and to look more closely at the Lamb because we have the ability to turn any moment about us no matter how holy that it is. We have the ability to allow our emotions to enter in and even, forgive me, to ruin what God's trying to do in us because we are so concerned about how we feel about ourselves. Awkward silence is purposed to prepare our hearts to receive something of great weight. We see Jesus silent so many times in scriptures, not just before his accusers, but there are times where he's asked questions and he takes it, he's slow to answer. There's times where he is questioned and he refuses or, they, or he's, um, he's approached and he will not go into what they want to go into. These places are for those who are asking the question. Why did the earth go dark when Jesus was being crucified? 
Wasn't it just one more sign? One more announcement of Jesus' identity from heaven? One more opportunity for his enemies to become his friends? Heaven's silence is always earth's call to listen. And so if we want to make a personal application in this, we all have times where we're praying and it feels like we're getting no answers. That's not a calling to pray different, but to listen more closely. Just, I, I've had conversations with a particular friend of mine lately. God's speaking. We just need to listen. And, when we, and once we hear, it's not our calling to run. It's our calling to keep listening. But sometimes God's silence Silences himself, not because he's displeased, but because he wants us to learn to listen. Because often, if we're honest, we come to God just to find out when, who, and why, and maybe where. And so we're not listening to hear from him. We're listening to hear an answer for ourselves. Many times we're already in running position, waiting to get that answer because we want to go. And sometimes God just slows everything down for us because there is a beauty and a purpose and a power in silence. You know, the first church silence was one of their disciplines. They didn't just pray and read their Bible and go to church. They fasted and they practiced silence. There's something about when we finally stop talking where we're able to, because some of us, and I'm one of them, struggle with our minds. We have moments where we can stop talking, but we say, I can't turn my brain off. You know why that is? We don't practice silence. Because the more we practice silence, the more in control of our thought life we become. And so if we practice silence, we get control of those things that we think are beyond our control. Part of how we take captive every thought that presents itself or sets itself up against the knowledge or the obedience of, to Christ Jesus is learning how to be silent. Learning how to quiet our thoughts so that we can discern and decipher God's voice. There's a purpose in the silence. Now as for the timing where it tells us that heaven went silent for about half an hour, I don't believe there's anything mystical or prophetic Im of, or pro of prophetic import to the amount of time. To me, it just seems more to just mark that the silence was brief in the scope of eternity, but was significant for us as human beings. Just think about it for one more minute with me. Think about this from and the impact it must have had on John. John was in a vision, in a glorious and at times frightening vision. And then, still in the vision, there was 30 minutes of silence. One of the books I was reading this week said, Imagine doing a corporate reading of the book of Revelation and taking this verse literally and actually sitting silent for 30 minutes between verse 1 and verse 2. Awkward, right? Mm -hmm. But what if after three minutes the awkward wore off and the depth began to be revealed? See, here's why some of us don't get to that place of depth. We won't endure the times of awkward. Some of us won't be quiet long enough to let something change in our hearts and our lives. Some of us won't be quiet long enough to actually move on from the things we need to let go of. Some of us won't silence our hearts, our minds, or our lives long enough. And we'll say, I tried, and we didn't. We tried until it got hard. 30 minutes of silence in heaven seems to start to change everything. I want to encourage you. Practice silence. Learn to stop feeling the need to explain every emotion. Some of our emotions keep us in bondage because we keep talking about them. And I'm not saying there's not things that need to be talked through. What I am saying is familiar things keep hold because we keep giving them life. The power of life and death is in the tongue. What if we learned how to stay silent in our anxiety until our anxiety fled? What if we learned to stay silent in our familiar places until our familiar places became unfamiliar? Heaven teaches us that silence matters. And that silence has the power to actually change things. Tonight, while we won't actually experience the silence, let's try to feel the weight of it as we move from verse 1 to verse 2. And I want us to notice, there doesn't appear to be any sound until we get to verse 5. It seems that there's 30 minutes of silence, there's a half an hour of silence, but then even as things start happening, nobody says anything. There are no words spoken. 
until we get near the end of this. Verse 2, John says, And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Now, the identity of the seven angels is a mystery. And there are a few theories about that, but most of them require quite a bit of stretching um, and, and, and not a lot of hermeneutical work to try to figure them out. Some say that must have been the seven angels of the seven churches of Revelation. But the way I read it, that can't be. Because personally, I believe those angels were nothing more than the human leaders of the churches. But even if you chose to believe those seven angels were actually angels, um, it, it doesn't work because angels are not omnipresent. And so if those churches had an angel each, but these were the angels that stood in the presence of God, they can't be in the same place at the same time. And so we really don't know... And if I can be real honest, it really doesn't matter. The article, the, makes us want to know who we are. Because it doesn't just say that there were seven angels. It says the seven angels. But again, there is danger. There is the danger of getting so caught up in uncovering the mysteries that we look away from the clear truth being set for us. The angels matter much less than the one they stand before. And they matter much less than the one who's giving the trumpets to them. So let's move from the angels to the trumpets. Trumpets have a lot of biblical significance. The Old Testament shows us how trumpets or shofars were used in Israel. Just a few of these. Numbers chapter 10 verses 7 and 8. A trumpet was blasted to gather the Lord's people. Numbers chapter 10 verse 9. The trumpet sounded to assemble the Lord's army. 1 Kings chapter 1 verses 34 through 39. A trumpet was sounded to announce that there was a new king. Leviticus chapter 28 verse 9 says that a trumpet would sound to proclaim the year of Jubilee. Trumpets were used to gather God's people for worship, for war, and for celebration. But here's what I want us to see. The trumpets were always an announcement to God's people. So these trumpets have to have something to do with us, not just the world. I believe that's an important point. Because while we associate the trumpets with judgment because of what happens after each one is sounded... I believe they're actually instruments of grace and mercy. Because whenever the trumpet was blown in Israel, it was God communicating with his people to keep them at peace in the midst of trial, to draw them near for a time of worship, or to celebrate his goodness and his mercy and his love for them. The trumpets don't cause the judgments. They announce the work of God. And again, let's remember, this is all God's work. Jesus opens the. Uh, Jesus is the one who opens the seal. Jesus is the one who holds the scroll. Jesus was the one who sent the horsemen. And Jesus will be the one who distributes the trumpets. The trumpets are not judgment. They announce judgment that comes from God. So that means the trumpets are God's way of communicating with his people. Let's move to verse 3. It says, Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. Now, here's where we are going to need to open our hearts and our eyes, possibly a little bit wider than what we have been comfortable with in the past. The first six seals have shown us nothing but the sovereignty of God. The Lamb has given all the authority that has been used. Everything that has happened has happened by the hand of God, and it has happened for the glory of God. But in verse 3, God's sovereignty does not give way. There is no point in any of this where God stops being sovereign. But in his sovereignty in verse 3, he includes, he grafts in, he intertwines the prayers of the saints with the sovereignty of God. What it says here is that our prayers are mixed with, are part of God's sovereign purpose and of God's power. We are included. You and I, and we'll get to this. This isn't just the prayers of the seven churches, the prayers of those at the moment. You and I are included in what we are reading in Revelation 8 by our prayers. See, I think this is the reason for the silence at the opening of the seal. It's to keep us from rushing ahead to see what happens next so that we'll concentrate on what God is showing us now. Because in our minds, all we want to know is what happens when those trumpets sound. 
right? Because we've already seen the angels go out. We've already seen the horsemen go out. So we're already in this apocalyptic mindset, meaning we're already anticipating Armageddon. We're looking for the Antichrist. We're waiting for the dragon. We want to know when we get raptured. We're, we're looking for all of the timing things, and something much more important than timing is happening in the middle of all of this. And so heaven goes silent so that we'll be stopped. We are part of what God is doing. Again, let's remember the context of Revelation. It was written originally to seven churches that were facing persecution. It was not just a vision that said God wins at the end. It was a calling for them to endure, for them to remain, for them to persevere, and for them to pray. I really believe this. We are reading Revelation wrongly if we're looking for the details of the end rather than our calling in this present moment. It is not the story of the final battle. It is a call for the church to gird up for battle now because while victory is sure and victory is promised, there is work that must currently and continually be done. Please don't forget this. We are not the first generation to read this. We're not the second generation to read this. This has been read for 2,000 years years. And so if every generation has read it to figure out the end, then every generation has missed the mark and missed the point. And why would God do that? Why would God give such an important vision? Why would he say that those who read this and understand it are blessed? Why would he give us such a clear picture of Jesus and then say, now you go figure out when he comes back? We make things complicated that are meant to be not simple, but are meant to be clear. This is a clear picture of Jesus, and it is a clear picture of the church. And so this is not about us figuring out timing. It is about us knowing our role no matter what time it is. Because this is the truth. Every gener the church of every generation has had the same calling in light of Revelation. Every single generation. So if Jesus returns in our lifetime, we have the same calling as if he returns in another hundred years and that generation. Every generation. We have the same calling that the apostles had. We have the same calling that Martin Luther had. We have the same calling that the Great Awakening had. Our calling in light of Revelation is the same. To offer our prayers as incense to join the work of God as he prepares for the return of his son. And so we have the seven angels being given seven trumpets. But then there's this other angel. Just like in chapter 7, when what we were told was there were the four angels that were given authority to bring harm to the earth, that they went to each corner of the earth. And then another angel enter, entered into their vision and held them up because it wasn't time yet. Here again, we have seven, seven um, angels that have their authority, that have been given their calling, and then another angel comes in, and he's holding a golden censer, and he is given much incense. Now, just to make this simple for those that may not been, have been raised in any tradition of incense, a censer is nothing more than an incense burner. If you've ever been to a funeral mass, it is the thing, it is the, the metal vessel that the priest uses as he walks around the body and he shakes it so that the incense that is burning can be smelled, can be di uh, uh, dispensed there in that place. Everything that is given to the angels is given by either the one who sits on the throne or the lamb. So when it says that the angel was given much incense, the incense comes from God. So the incense has a purpose. It does not stand alone. It is given to the angel that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. The Greek literally says that he might give it to the prayers of all the saints. So read it that way as you're looking at, at whatever translation you're using. That he was given much incense that he might give the incense to the prayers of all the saints. So I think there's two huge points that we have to look at here. First of all, God adds something to our prayers. And I believe that something is grace. Grace is that indefinable thing, right? By grace we are saved. Grace is uh, God's riches at Christ's expense. What grace is, is anything that we do not have in ourselves, but we need to please God. And so I believe that what we're seeing is that God adds grace 
to our prayers. This is why we don't have to worry or worry about or fear praying the wrong thing. If we do, he will correct us, but he will also add the grace that is needed to the prayers that we are praying. See, our prayers are only powerful because of the grace that God adds. We have no power in and of ourselves, but the spirit who is in us is filled with power, and the God that is listening to us is filled with power, and the Christ that is mediating for us is filled with power. And so all of the, pray all of the power of prayer comes from the one working in us, the one mediating for us, and the one listening to us. There literally, forgive me for a minute, there is no power in our prayers unless God adds his grace to our prayers. And so the power of prayer is not in our function, it's in God's generosity. Our prayers don't change God's mind. They don't cause him to do things that he wouldn't otherwise do. Our prayers involve us in God's sovereign will. Romans 8.26 tells us, Likewise, the Spirit leads us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Stop there just a second with me. Romans 8.26, write it down if you want to. You can go to it at some point if you don't know it already. It says, this is our weakness. We do not know what to pray for as we ought. Forgive me, but notice, it doesn't say sometimes we don't know. Right. It says loud and clear, here's my weakness and here's your weakness. We don't know how to pray rightly. We don't know what to pray for. Now think of this in light of what Paul taught us. Pray without ceasing. So put this together. Pray without ceasing, you don't know what to pray for. So prayer is this incredible act of trusting God not to do what we're saying or to do what we're asking, but to take our unknowing prayers and mix them with his perfect will and work out everything that needs to be worked out. Prayer is not just dependence. Prayer is when we begin to recognize I am totally empty because the one thing I'm called to do at all times, I don't know how to do. And yet God in his generosity has put his spirit in me so that while I don't know how to pray, he prays rightly in me, for me, and through me. Our prayers are not powerful until God adds his grace to them. Which means, though, that our prayers are more powerful than we'll ever realize because God's already promised to add his grace to them. Revelation 8.3 is the visual picture of what Romans 8.26 promises. So Romans 8.26 promises, just keep praying and the Spirit will handle it. And Revelation 8.3 says, when your prayers get here, they're mixed with the grace of God. Our prayers are not just heard, they are fixed and worked on and shaped until they become what they are needed to be. We don't know what to pray for as we ought, but the Holy Spirit intercedes for us and God adds his grace to our prayers. Don't ever fear praying the wrong thing. Trust the grace that is going to be added, that it will do the work that is needed to change our hearts and to use our prayers. But above all else, just keep praying. So the first thing we see here is that God adds his grace to our prayers. But I think the second point, if it's possible, might be even bigger. God has chosen for our prayers to have a part in his kingdom. This is now the third time that our prayers have been mentioned in this letter. In chapter 5, verse 8, after the lamb had taken the scroll, that, uh, we're told that the creatures and the elders all fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. This, again, messes with our idea of Revelation being linear, a linear thing, the idea that it just goes in chronological order. Think of this for a minute. In Revelation 5, we see the golden bowls filled with the finished prayers, meaning those that are already mixed with grace. But then here in Revelation 8, we see the process at work where our prayers and God's grace are being mixed together. And so, again, Revelation is not meant to say we go from A to B to C to D, the end. It's meant to show us who Jesus is, and it's meant to show us that Jesus is working in all things. In chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, we actually get to hear the prayers of the martyrs as they're asking God to avenge their blood. But then here, the third time, in Revelation 8, I think we need to learn to see prayer in an entirely different light because of how clearly God shows us what prayer really is. 
Now, I agree with the scholars and commentators that believe that the word all is very significant. Personally, I believe the prayers of all the saints means every prayer that has ever been prayed by every believer in Jesus. Think about that for a minute. The golden bowls of all the saints, prayers of all the saints. That means you've never prayed a prayer that isn't in heaven. That means that your prayers are in the bowls with your parents and your grandparents. Our prayers are in the bowls with Wesley and Whitfield, with Luther. With Our prayers are in the bowls with Peter and James and John and Paul. Our prayers are mixed with the prayers of all of the saints. This is literally all the prayers of all the saints. That means, and this is incredibly important, the most lasting thing we will ever do is pray. But as we keep reading, it means the most powerful thing we will ever do is pray. So that means that as important as our ministry is, as important as our love is, as important as our relationships are, as important as our songs and our sermons and our books and our good deeds are, the one thing that is in heaven eternally, the one thing that is in front of God forever and ever are our prayers. It doesn't mean don't do the other things. It means prioritize prayer because prayer is the thing that lasts. It means that all the other things must come from prayer and be closed in prayer and closed clothed with prayer. It means that if we're going to be givers, give in prayer. If we're going to be preachers, preach in prayer. If we're going to be goers, go in prayer. If we're going to be singers, sing in prayer. It means that all of those other things find their power in prayer, but the only thing that persists, the only thing that lasts, is our prayers. We find no picture of bowls filled with sermons, <laughs> but we are shown very clearly that all the prayers of all the saints are in God's presence. Verse 4 says, And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. If you ever wonder if your prayers actually get to God, that's your picture. If you've ever questioned, if you've ever doubted, if you've ever feared, if you've ever thought, you know what, God, I just don't think God hears my prayers. I don't think... What you might be saying is God doesn't do what I ask him to do. But we have this incredible picture of all of the prayers getting to the throne of God. Verse 5 says, Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. I assume it's a complete coincidence that right now there is lightning and there is thunder in this storm that we're having while we read through this. But I want us to really take some time to really hear what happens here. So the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to earth. And that fire, as it makes its way to earth, causes noises and thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. Listen to what Thomas Torrance wrote about that verse. The fire comes from the very altar on which the prayers of the saints have been offered. This surely means that the prayers of God's people play a necessary part in ushering in the judgments of God. What are the real master powers behind the world? And what are the deeper secrets of our destiny? Here is the astonishing answer. The prayers of the saints and the fire of God. That means that more potent, more powerful than all the dark and mighty powers let loose in the, earth, in the world, more powerful than anything else is the power of prayer set ablaze by the fire of God and cast upon the earth. When you read verse 5, did you catch that? Did you put chapter, verse 3, 4, and 5 together to understand that if our prayers are sitting on the altar, if our prayers are being offered up on the altar, when the censer scoops fire from the altar, that it is our prayers that are being scooped from the altar, and then when there, the fire is thrown to the earth, that it is our prayers that are prayed from earth, arrive in heaven, and then from heaven are cast back to the earth to make a difference. It is our prayers that are changing and and doing what God desires. It's our prayers that are accomplishing the will of God. It's our prayers that he has used for his purpose. He doesn't have to. We don't have to have any part in any of this. But in his generosity and in his grace, he has chosen that his judgments 
are birthed by our prayers. That means that the judgment of God is not a response to the evil of the world, but the answer to the prayers of the saints. This means that the return of Christ will not be brought about by the signs of the times, but by the fervent prayers of the church. Mm -hmm. This is what the answer to thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven looks like. John Piper wrote, The consummation of history will be owing to the supplication of the saints who cry to God day and night. We get to go back to one of my pet peeves. This means that the heavens will never be like brass. It is a lie against the character of God to say that God would turn his head from his people. Now, we are shown places in Scripture where what it says is that our prayers are difficult or our prayers aren't heard, but that's referring to people who have separated themselves from God. But the saints, the prayers of the saints, our prayers are an open line, not to get from God, but to join God in God's purposes. This is why time in prayer is never wasted time. This is why men always ought to pray and never lose heart. God is listening. Our prayers are lasting. And God's answer is appointed. Your prayers, my prayers, our prayers sound the trumpets. Yes, I know that it's angels that blow them, but it is our prayers that prepare them. It is the, our prayers are what God chooses to use to determine the timing and the desire of his judgment. Keep praying. His kingdom is coming and his, and his will is being and will be done on earth as it is in heaven by God's use of our prayers. Right now, we are in this time where we're all wondering, well, what can we do? We can't go here. We can't go there. We can pray. What if this is God's gift to his church? What if this, this is the silence? There's silence in heaven. What if this four months, this six months, this year, whatever it turns out to be, what if this is God creating a silence in the church so that the church would return to its place of prayer? The silence of heaven showed us the power of prayer. What if the silence of earth could make the church become a prayerful, powerful people yet again? What if instead of doing all the things we love doing, we should do the one thing that lasts forever? What if our songs won't change it? What if our sermons can't change it? What if our studies can't change it? What if our miracle work Working gifts can't change it, but prayer doesn't change our situation. It moves God's heart. It, it, it injects us into God's timing. It does God's will. Mm. I want to ask you right now, would you pray more now than you've ever prayed before? Because we all have the opportunity. Right? We all have the time. We're all talking about all these things that we'd like to do. Some want to read a book. Some want to start a business. Some want to lose weight. Some want this. Pray because whenever God silences things, and that doesn't always just mean quiet, sometimes it means stopping things we're used to. Whenever God silences something, it's for his people to hear him. But it's also for his people to respond to him. See, the way that we're going through this, and the way that I believe this needs to be taught, turns completely upside down the way that we have used and understood 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If you haven't memorized it, I'm sure every single one of us is at least familiar with it. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Before we go back to that verse, it's important that we have a little context. Because one of my struggles with that, the use of that verse is rarely as context ever involved. It was the dedication of Solomon's temple. When Solomon had finished praying the prayer of dedication, we're told that fire fell from heaven. So just like what we see here in Revelation chapter 8, Solomon prays and fire comes from heaven. What we see in Revelation 8 is the accumulation of the prayers of the saints become the fire that comes down from heaven. Fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. And we're told that the glory of the Lord filled the temple. That's the Shekinah glory, the cloud, the visible manifestation of God's glory. When the people of Israel saw the glory of God for themselves, again, because, the fire in response, because of the fire in response to Solomon's prayer. Forgive me a minute. This is all a response to prayer. 
If Solomon doesn't pray, the fire doesn't fall, Israel doesn't worship, the promise doesn't get made. Right? And so, again, we know prayer has power, but we get tired of it. We get bored of it. This is our problem. We're not enduring people. We're not persevering people. We're not persistent people. We pray with one eye open, yeah. waiting to see if what we asked for is going to come to pass. And if it doesn't, we move on to the next thing. Yeah. We don't pray for years. We don't pray for decades. We don't pray for centuries. We pray for moments. And then we want things to be different. And the reality is prayer gets to heaven, but it changes us. And so Solomon prayed, and God responded. And then Israel saw the response of God, and it says that all of Israel knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground, and they worshipped and gave thanks and said, He is good. His love endures forever. Guys, you know those are my two favorite things to say about God. Those are my two favorite things ever written about God. But they are things that were birthed because of prayer. If you want to know God's goodness, become a man of prayer. If you want to know the enduring, the steadfast, unceasing love of God, give yourself to prayer. It's not what God needs to do for you to see his love. It's what you need to do to see the love of God. The stuff that's in between us is not stuff that God needs to pull out. It's stuff we need to break through. Mm. I, I can't even believe I used that word. I hate the word breakthrough. Forgive me, some of you are laughing right now, I hate it, because, you know, your breakthrough is coming, 12 steps to breakthrough, all of those things, and breakthrough is not something that happens to us, it's something that we work our way toward. Breakthrough happens through discipline, through maturity, through obedience, through prayerfulness. Breakthrough is what we would actually should be, instead of praying for and looking for and teaching about breakthrough, we should be teaching about consistency, about faithfulness, about endurance. Because those are the things that the scriptures teach us about. Israel saw God because God responded to Solomon's prayers. Israel falls on their face. They worship. They sing. It says, then sacrifices were made by the king and by all the people. Solomon himself offered 22,000 head of cattle and 120,000 sheep and goats. The priests and the Levites took their positions with their musical instruments. They followed the example from the tabernacle of David. The priests blew their trumpets. All the people of Israel stood on their feet, and they all declared again, His love endures forever. The dedication of the temple lasted for seven days, and on the eighth day, Solomon sent everyone home. The Bible says they went home joyful and glad in heart for the good things the Lord had done for David and Solomon and for his people Israel. And then, at some point, and we don't know if it was a day later, if it was a long time later, but at some point after the dedication of the temple and after the building of Solomon's palace, the Lord came and he appeared to Solomon. And God said, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. That means that all that God was saying was a response to the prayers that he had heard. This is important because, again, it sets up the context for the famous verse 14. So God is not dealing with an obstinate people at this point. At this point, Israel is at the height of their worship. The whole country is worshipped. They've seen the glory of God. They've offered sacrifices. They are at their spiritual peak. So God is not coming to an obstinate, stubborn, or sinful people in these moments. And so God continues... From that place of worship and joy and festivities and sacrifice and glory and miracles and the response of God, God then says, when I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Look at what's happening. God was answering Solomon's prayer by telling Solomon how he would work to create even more prayer from his people. God didn't say, if you sin, then I'll do this. God did not say, if you turn from me, if you take idols. He didn't say, Solomon, if you chase other women who lead you to other gods, I'm going to cause these things. God said, at the height of their prayer life, here's what I'll do to cause more prayer. 
Just think about those verses again. What was the origin of the drought, the famine, and the plague? God said, when I do these things. Again, that means those things were not happening to them. They were happening for them. So what was the purpose of the drought, the famine, and the plague? The purpose was for God to lead his people to pray. When I do this, if my people will pray, I will respond. This is not a verse about averting judgment. This is not a verse about coming back from becoming reprobate. This is not a verse about how a sinful nation can somehow push away the judgment of God. This is about understanding God's judgment is always about leading God's people to seek God's face. It is a call to prayer. So what God was saying is, as near to me as you are right now, I will do things to bring you nearer. As completely dependent upon you and me as you are now, I will do things to make you more dependent. As much as you have searched your heart, I will lead you to search your heart in a deeper manner. It's God saying, I love your prayers so much, your prayers are so useful and so necessary, that I will order your lives to make you more devoted to prayer. It is not God saying, I've heard your prayers, things are going to get better. It's God saying, I've heard your prayers, and I will do whatever needs to be done to make you more prayerful. It's not God saying, and listen, as humans, we get to this point where we go, is it, you know, is it just never enough? Here's the answer to that, no. But it's not because there's not enough. It's because of the joy that our prayers create in heaven and the work that God knows our prayers will do in our hearts. So it's not God saying, you haven't done enough. It's God saying, there's more. I want more. Think of it this way. It's not God pushing us away and saying, that's not good enough. It's God saying, I love this so much, I want another hour of your time. I love this so much, I want another day of your life. I love this so much that I want to hear that song again. I want to hear those words again. I I want to hear your heart again. It's never God saying what you just did is inferior. It's always God saying it's so satisfying that I want more of your heart and I want more of your prayers. Listen to what God said in verses 15 and 16 because it continues. Again, we often just end with heal their land, but that wasn't the end of what God said. In verses 15 and 16, God says, now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. Again, God was not angry or threatening wrath. He was revealing how he would deepen the relationship. And let's be honest, most of us do not thrive in prosperity. Most of us pray deeply and desperately when things are at its worst. When we don't know what to do, we pray desperately. But when the answer is come, most of us pull back. It is foreign and odd to us that Jesus prayed and that Jesus worked miracles in Capernaum, that he healed every person that came, and then he got up in the middle of the night and went to pray. We want to pray before the crowd comes so we'll have power to use in ministry, but Jesus went after the power because he wanted to be with his Father. It is foreign to us that after he fed the 5,000, he went upon a mountain so that he could pray because we think that's the time to bask. That's the time to talk about it. That's that's the time to rejoice in it. That's the time to debrief over it. And instead, Jesus is saying, the miracles are nothing unless the prayer is continual. We need to change the way we pray. And I don't mean the words. I mean the way we understand prayer. It's not how we get stuff from God. It's how we get our hearts connected to God's. And so if you want to pray effective prayers, this is the honest truth. Pray more. It's not about percentages. It's about faithfulness. Are we willing to be faithful to pray over and over and over again? We all know, you've all heard the parable of the persistent widow. She would not give the, the judge rest until he heard her. Our father is not like the judge. He is righteous and he is listening and he is kind. So shouldn't that cause even more persistence? Because our prayers aren't trying to get him to do our will. Our prayers are coming into his presence, knowing his love, knowing his character, aligning our hearts with his. 
Again, the drought, the famine, and the plagues were not in response to anyone's sin, but it was God's desire for their prayers, for greater nearness, and for deeper trust. In the next verses, God did deal with Solomon about what would happen if Israel fell into sin, but that's not until after he'd already made these promises and already made these desires. We keep trying to end what we call bad, but God keeps using those quote-unquote bad things to draw us nearer to him in prayer. Literally, how can a drought be bad if it makes us more prayerful? How can, how can the drought that God sent upon Israel when Ahab and Jezebel were king and queen, how could it be a negative thing if it returned the hearts of Israel to God? Do we look back on it now and say, oh, I can't believe there was a drought? Or do we look at it and say, thank God he's so persistent that he would even use a drought to bring our hearts back to him? But that was a sin situation. So what we decide, and, and listen, Maybe I'm splitting hairs, but to me there's a big difference here, so follow me for a second. So was the drought in response to the people's sin, or was the drought God's desire to have the people's hearts? Did God say, since you're such sinners, I'm not going to let it rain for three and a half years? Or did God say, since I want you so desperately, I know that the lack of rain for a multitude of years will bring you back to me? His judgment is for the purpose of mercy. If he was just angry, he would have just wiped them out. He would have just done away with them. But instead, he found the way because he knows the way to lead their hearts back to them. Go back with me briefly to Revelation 8, and we'll start to come to a close. In verse 5, the fire that is ultimately thrown to earth, that produced lightnings, thunderings, and earthquakes, came from the altar. That's incredibly important in our understanding, especially as we go forward into the blowing of the trumpets. The altar is the place of mercy. So the fire that was thrown from heaven to earth was thrown from the place of mercy. It's at the altar where God accepts the sacrifice with fire. And why does he accept the sacrifice? To give mercy to the one who has made the offering. The fire that comes to earth is judgment that desires mercy. It's judgment that produces mercy. Don't forget, when we, begin, when we begin studying the trumpets in two weeks, don't forget the scenes of chapter 7. Don't forget the salvation of the multitudes of every nation. Don't forget the complete salvation of Israel. And again, Revelation is not chronological, and it's not linear. In many ways, it's not even literal. But we must be willing to see that everything that happens in the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls is to produce the salvation that is revealed in chapter 7. Mm. Judgment comes so that salvation can be given. The end of the world is not when sin over, overwhelms it, but when grace has reached its completion. The world won't end when sin is more than God can deal with. The world will end when the last soul that can be saved will be saved. This is all about mercy. It's all about grace. And I know that I've said over and over again tonight that, we, that the timing is not as important as the character, and that is true. But if the prayers of the saints are being thrown back to earth, doesn't it at least make you sit there and go, then there must be saints still on earth, still adding to those bulls. There's a work that's happening that I can't bring myself to believe the church isn't in the midst of and the church isn't actually even leading the way for. But we'll get to more of that as we move further through this. So just for tonight, here's our conclusion. Everything happens by God. But it all happens through prayer. The things that we are seeing in our world right now are not the result of prayerlessness. They are God's response to the prayers of his people. This is how God wins souls. This is how God breaks strongholds. This is how God gives grace. This is how God offers mercy. This is how the works of the devil are destroyed and the kingdom of God is expanded. Because God knows that when the hand of man begins to squeeze upon the church, the church devotes itself back to prayer. Isn't that what we saw in the book of Acts? That the church did what they were called to. But when persecution began, not only did they scatter, but they gave themselves to prayer. What was Paul and Silas doing in the prison? in, in uh, 
in Philippi. They were singing hymns and praying. What was the church doing when Peter was about to be executed? They were praying. There's something about persecution that brings about prayer. And so God, in his wisdom, he permits persecution because it brings about the prayers of the saints. And so even today, as we read about persecution going to brand new levels in China, a place where the church was already being persecuted, don't pray for the persecution to stop. Pray for the church to persist in prayer. Pray Pray for them to be protected. Pray for them to persevere. Pray for them to prosper in prayer. Because if they will pray more, if we will pray more, if the church will pray more, God will do his will. And so that's going to be kind of my last thing for tonight. And you know what? I'm talking to a camera instead of you, so you don't get to interject. So I'll take advantage of that for a minute. Instead of us worrying about the government, concentrate on the government of heaven. Instead of us being out campaigning, have campaigns of prayer. Instead of us being worried and arguing and fighting and even getting to the place of anxious and taking sides against each other in our current condition, make sure we are people devoting ourselves to prayer, praying for the will of God, the purpose of God, the heart of God, the character of God. What if this is what we need for revival? What if this is what we need for a great awakening? What if this is what we need to finally repent of our national sins, to finally repent of the places of rebellion, to finally repent of the places places where we've used God's name for our own purposes rather than God's? What if this is the place where we as the church finally take our place, not as part of the political lobby, but as the people of God, the fire of God, the heart and the character of God in our community? This stuff is not happening to us, it's happening for us, but it is drawing us nearer to God. Right now, heaven is focused and stable. Because all of heaven can see the Lamb. Right now, the church must be focused and stable by devoting ourselves to the work of prayer. It's the only prayer, it's the only thing that lasts. J. Ramsey Michaels wrote, Prayer is the engine driving the plan of God toward completion. Let's stop adding our prayer. Let's never stop adding our prayers to God's altar. Paul said, pray without ceasing. Revelation reveals that our prayers are never ending. But above all else, our prayers are producing God's will. His kingdom is coming. His will is being done. God is always working. His people must be always praying. And so I want to encourage and even challenge you, pray more. If you struggle with it, pray with somebody. That is the greatest way to build your prayer life. Find somebody and ask them, even in your timidity, even in your feeling ashamed or awkward, ask them, could we pray together? Every other Monday night, we pray together through Zoom. Join us. On Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 1230 on Facebook, we have a prayer time. Join us. But I can't stress this enough. Call somebody. Text somebody. Reach out to somebody in church and ask them, would you begin praying with me? And be honest, I'm not comfortable praying out loud. Prayer's always been difficult. I've never been someone who's been persistent. I've never been able to keep a, st a steady prayer life. Reach out to somebody and do it together. Because when God's people pray, it's not that God does different stuff. It's that we get invited into the stuff God's doing. We don't change God's will. We join God's will. But here's why that matters. We live differently when we know God's heart. See, if you know that what's happening in our world right now, God is sovereignly in control of, you live it with it. You ask for his will to be done in it. Doesn't mean you enjoy it. Doesn't mean that you're not affected by it. It means you trust him in it. And that's what has to happen for all of us. We have to stop being afraid of what might happen to us and start asking, God, what are you doing in this? And here's what I can tell you he's doing in this. He is working for souls to be saved. He is working for Jesus to be glorified. He's working for the church to take its place so that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. He's working for strongholds to be torn down and for his kingdom to come and his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Someday, at the appropriate moment, God will throw our, the, an angel will throw our prayers back from heaven to earth in the form of fire. Let's make sure he has plenty to throw. Let's join the work of God. Let's join the heart of God.
Let's not be those who get caught up in worldly things. Let's be those who do the work of heaven, who pray and pray and pray and pray. If prayer is a struggle for you and you'd like to talk about it, reach out to me. If you don't know what to pray, Romans 8.26 says none of us do. But the key is to start praying. If you'd like somebody to pray with you, I am glad to do it. Send a message. Send me a text if you've got my number. Send a message here if you don't. But I believe that if we would be prayerful people, not only would we be a part of what God's doing, it would change who we are. And our calling as a church and the calling of the church of every single generation. And I'm going to finish with this. Forgive me for continuing to go. But I said earlier that the church's response to Revelation has been supposed, has, we've been called to have the same response every generation since the vision was first given. It's prayer. That's the call. That's why we're here. That's what God wants. That's what God's doing. And that's what lasts eternally. Let's be a people. So our next time together, we'll pick up with uh, Revelation chapter 8, verse 7, and we'll start talking about the trumpets. Um, it's interesting because we're going to talk about a perspective of the trumpets that I'm not sure how comfortable we'll all be with, but I believe that it is, it's, it's worth exploring and understanding. And again, don't forget, judgment does not come to bring destruction. It, brings, it comes to offer grace. It comes to offer mercy. And so don't, let's not be afraid of something that God is actually using for our good and for his glory. So that'll be in two weeks. Next Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, we'll, we'll discuss this passage on Zoom. We'd love to have you join us for that discussion. If we don't have your email address, send it to us here on Facebook, and we will make sure you're included in the invitation. Um, that will go out probably um, next Wednesday during the day at some point or Tuesday evening. Um, with that, I just would like to just share a couple of real brief things with you tonight as we close in prayer. Um, uh, our, our dear friend... Uh, Reverend um, Peter Jackson, uh, PJ's dad, is having surgery tomorrow. We want to keep him in prayer. Um, if I got the dates right, I believe um, you know our, our, our buddy Dank is having surgery as well on Friday. Um, and then we want to continue for, to pray for our, our, our dear friend and our missionary April um, as she is uh, battling cancer in the Philippines. Um, her, her diagnosis um, is a difficult one, and so we just want to pray for God's power, um, God's comfort, and God's presence, um, and, and how God shows his love to her and how he continues to show his love through her. So would you join me as we close in prayer tonight? Heavenly Father, thank you that every time we open our mouths to you, we don't have to wonder if we're being heard. We don't have to worry about saying just the right thing. We don't have to follow anyone else's example or figure out the formula. We can just be confident that our prayers are always heard. Not only do they make it to heaven, but they become a part of God's will. And so I pray tonight that we would be a praying people. And Father, I'll start with me tonight. Forgive me for my prayerlessness. Forgive me for making prayer such an obligation instead of a privilege. Forgive me for making prayer a part of my work instead of a part of our relationship. Forgive me for making prayer how I get you to do things rather than how I get to be with you. And so I just pray tonight that you would change my heart and you would change all of our hearts, that you would forgive us for our places of being prayerless and that we would become a prayerful people. I pray tonight, God, that there are people watching that will decide to join prayer partners, that there will be people tonight that decide to reach out to a friend or a family member and say, let's start praying. And that we'll just start talking to you and letting you work and letting you work in us and work through us. That we'll just let your will change our hearts. And I pray that we become enduring prayers, persistent prayers. Not just people who pray a time or two, but people who decide that our time will be spent praying. Make us a church that prays, that builds bridges and tears down strongholds through the prayer, uh, consistent prayer life. Father, tonight we come to you with needs that we have in our own small group. Lord, we pray for both Peter and Dank as they have surgery in these next few weeks, excuse me, next few days. I pray that you would touch their bodies and bring healing. I pray for their doctors and their nurses that they would have your wisdom and your skills. I pray that their bodies would respond well to the anesthesia, that their bodies would respond well to the actual surgery. I pray, God, that all of the issues would be not just uh, made better but resolved. I pray that you would remove every, every cell that doesn't belong, that you would correct everything that is not as it should be, and that they would go home whole, complete, knowing that you've put your hand upon them. 
And I pray that the recovery process would be good and would be whatever is necessary for you to be glorified. I pray that you would use their situations to win souls, that you would use it to draw their families closer to you, that you would use it to show them just how sovereign you are, that they are kept by the power of God through faith. And tonight, God, we pray for April. We thank you for her service of you. We thank you for her kindness, for her generosity, for her sweet spirit. We ask tonight, God, that you would overwhelm her with your presence. Father, your word tells us that you send your word and heal disease. And so we pray tonight that you would heal April of cancer, that you would remove every cancer cell from her body, from the top of her head to the soles of her feet, that you would make her whole. But God, at this moment, I pray that she would know your presence in a tangible way, that you would surround her with songs of deliverance, that you would whisper your love over her, that she would be enveloped by that same cloud that came down at Solomon's temple. I pray that it would visit April's hospital. Amen. I pray that her family would experience the glory of God. And I pray that your will would be done and your kingdom would come in April's life the same way it has come through April's life, even as it is in heaven. Father, I pray tonight that we would let your word settle in our hearts. I pray that we would learn silence. I pray that we would choose prayer. I pray that we would not rush ahead, but we would learn how to sit with you. Thank you for wanting to hear us. Thank you for even sending droughts and famines and plagues just to get your people to pray. I pray today that we would be a praying people. I pray that when this pandemic finishes, and it will at some point finish, that we would be able to look at it and say, we became more devoted to prayer because of that season God allowed. pray that we would stop pushing and start praying. And as we pray, I pray, I pray that we'd listen. That we would build silence into our prayer lives. So that it's not just us telling you what we think you should do, but it's us hearing your heart. It's you showing us our hearts. And it's us being changed more and more into the image of Jesus so that he would be glorified, and ultimately, so that souls would be saved. Thank you for calling us to pray, and thank you for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us here tonight. If you have any last questions, if you have any comments, anything you want to share, please leave it there in the comments. I will be sure to read them. If you have needs, prayer needs, or just things you want to talk about, send us a message. If you would like help with becoming a more prayerful person, reach out. Um, there's nothing I love more than helping facilitate prayer. And so if there is a way that we can help you not pray better, but pray more, we will do whatever we can do. God bless you. We look forward to seeing you this Sunday morning um, here again on Facebook Live. Um, please keep an eye on our uh, Facebook page as there will be a update from our work in the Philippines that will be coming out in the next day or so. The weekly update will come out uh, either Friday night or Saturday morning, but you can always reach us here if you have questions or if you have needs. God bless you. We're so grateful for you. And just um, ask God to bless you and keep you, to make his face shine upon you, to lift his countenance on you and give you peace. Look forward to seeing you soon.